series entitled Samsonite versus Kryptonite. Samsonite versus Kryptonite. And uh, this is a message series that the Lord pressed upon my heart uh, actually a couple of months ago. And I've been excited to share this because I've never preached about Samson. You've heard it through Sunday schools if you grew up in church, but you've probably never heard an exposition. Four chapters of all the book of Judges, four God gives graciously to the baddest judge of them all. I don't mean judge in a, in a, a bad in a, in a good sense. You know, today we're like, that was bad, meaning good. I mean, talk about bad, the original language of bad, bad. Okay? A playboy named Samson, womanizer. Given over to sexual weaknesses. And yet God would devote four chapters more than any other judge in the book of Judges? Why would he do something like that? Why would God highlight all of his strengths, but all of his strong weaknesses as well? So we're all supposed to have this power. We're gifted by God. And all of you here are so gifted by the Lord. Can I get an amen to that? But if we'll be going through this for the next several weeks, that would you consider maybe your greatest strength can be the one thing that's holding you back from launching into all of the God's very best. And we see that God gave Sam some physical strength, and yet it was his physical power that led to his weakness and to his stumble and fall until he realized he needed to be strong in the Lord and not in himself. So we're going to be going through that together. And today we're starting it off in part one. And today it's found in Judges, the opening passages of the birth of Samson. Judges chapter 13, 1 through 7, and verses 24 to 25. If you're on the same page with me on your Bible apps, we're also going to put it up on the screen. If you're with me, can you let me know by saying out loud, amen. Okay? And because I haven't done this in a while, I just want to remind you, if you agree with something, uh, call a response, say an amen, or even preach it, brother, preach it, I don't know, whatever you feel like doing. But if you agree with it, make sure you exclaim that together in unity. Judges 13, 1 through 7. Let me read out loud God's holy word if you silently read along with me. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. And the people of Israel, again, everybody say again. Yeah. Point to someone next to them, they're doing it again, all right? Point to someone next to them, they're doing it again. Again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Point of someone next to them. That's a long time. Point of someone next to them. That's a long time. Just for doing something wrong, all right? Verse 2. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren. Everybody say barren. And had no children. Verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren. What an encouragement that is, huh? I already know my situation. And you angels of God tell me, Behold! Everybody get this news flash! You're barren. Why are you pointing that out to something that's already a painful reality and truth? Behold, you are barren and have not born children. Rubbing it a little bit differently. Same truth, but dipping in a different light. Make it even further. But, everybody say But. You shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come to his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me. And his appearance was like the the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I guess she was from California because we use awesome a lot. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from. And he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God. From the womb to the day of his death. Now verses 24. Skip on down to verse 24 to 25. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. Everybody say Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Manahadan Dan between Zorah and Estile. Let's bow our heads and pray. 
Heavenly Father, I pray you'll take hold of me now in the mighty name of Jesus and use me as your mouthpiece. God, I don't have the gift of singing. I can't even play an instrument even if I try. The only instrument I could play is iTunes, Lord. But Lord, you've given me the gift to preach and teach. But I can't use this gift in my own fleshly strength. I need you to take over Holy Spirit because these are gifts of the Holy Spirit. That means you have to use it in and through me, God. So I ask you, would you take hold of me and let me be used to be your mouthpiece. Prepare in Jesus' name all the hearts of your people, young and old, that they may receive this word with gladness and it will erupt with joy. Whatever they're facing, the joy of the Lord shall become strength, Lord God. To that end, Lord, if there's anyone who doesn't know you, Lord, may they experience the joy of salvation today. And to those who are saved, may they experience the joy of being awakened and coming back to you. Lord, have your way with us. We are thankful for what you're about to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, oh, you can do better than that. Everyone said, amen, amen. amen. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, in the ESV says, for we are his workmanship. Everybody say workmanship. Created in Christ for good works. Notice it says, not to have a good life, but created for good works. Which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Now the NIV has it differently. Instead of workmanship, it says, we are God's handiwork. Everybody say handiwork. handiwork. But you know, whenever I think of the modern word handiwork, uh, doesn't sound too good, doesn't it? Sounds like something's broken, something cheap's broken. You've got to call a handyman to come fix it up or something like that. So it's, it doesn't sound, give it due justice, but I love the NLT version, NLT, which actually has the greatest accuracy for this particular passage of that word uh, about what it means. Um, ESV says workmanship, NIV says handiwork, but the NLT says, for we are God's masterpiece. Everybody say masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Again, I want to reiterate, God didn't just call us to have a good life. He had good works so we could do the good things he planned before any of us came into being. And I do want to remind everyone that word masterpiece is the more accurate to the original wording. And that's why God says you are unique and one of a kind. I want you to point at someone. Else. Let's be encouraging today. Point at someone and say, you may not feel like it, but you are God's masterpiece. Point at someone else to you. Say, I know some of you don't feel like it. Some of your bodies are aching right now, and you're only 22 years of age. I know you don't feel like right now, because maybe you know that your kids are on the way to church because you made them late, or they made you late, or something like that. Maybe you don't feel like a masterpiece right now because you got a bad job performance review just recently. Whatever it may be, but don't go let the external reality kind of shape your reality. The truth is what God says, and God says you are a masterpiece and I'm working on you. Can I get an amen to that? And the way about this is God has made all of us unique. Everybody say unique. unique. Everybody lift your hands up right now. Just lift it up and look at your hands inside like this. We all know this. There is no set of fingerprints that you have that no one else could ever have as well. Even identical twins do not have the same fingerprints. And I was studying up on, do you realize, why do they make sure that they take all 10 fingerprints? If I give it on my right hand, shouldn't it be the same on the left, but just in reverse? No, every fingerprint on all your 10 digits are different as well. So everyone has different fingerprints and no one else could have it. So you're unique. Everybody say unique. Okay? That means that God's created you fingerprints that you're going to leave behind in this world. That what you touch, no one else can leave that same mark. What you do with, what you build with, it will have your distinctive fingerprint. Are you tracking with me? Can I get an amen? amen. No one else. Not even your twin brother or sister, even if they touch this iPad, will leave the same fingerprint as you. We all have different fingerprints. 
The Bible says we are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works before we were created. God had a wonderful plan for us to do. So we're supposed to, it's because I gave you this. You look at your hands and you see different fingerprints. I created you so that what I do in your life, you're supposed to leave a mark that no one else could ever leave behind. So that leads me to the title of this message, that we need to leave your mark in this word. Everybody take your right hand in this finger, stretch it out to the heavens above. I know it's been several weeks since I preached, so I know you're kind of like, oh man, I forgot about this, all right? I should have put some deodorant on today. It's all right. We all have the aroma of Christ. Take the anointing of God and point at three people next to you and encourage them today. Be a preacher today for the next 10 seconds. Say, you got to leave your mark in this world, all right? Point at someone else. You got to leave your mark in this world. Now, if you really agree with that, can I get a loud amen, all right? All right. This opening chapter in the life of Samson, we see how we are all called to leave a mark in this world. And I want to share with you just three things. And next week, I, I, I know it's the holidays, but I really don't want you to miss it because I'm going to be starting to go through what, I, what one author calls the Samson Syndrome. Twelve tendencies, despite his great strengths that made him fallible. So it's a word for all you men, but it's also a word for all you women. Because all of us are strong, and for all of us, this is so important. I wish next week wasn't a holiday, so try not to miss it, but I'm going to be going there. But today is just an introductory thing in that way. I want to share with you about how we're supposed to make a mark in this world and how God had called Samson for such a time as this to leave his mark. The first thing that we do, just following what the passage says, instead of just throwing what I, whatever I want, is do what is right in whose eyes? God's eyes or man's? Point to someone next to you and say, it's God's eyes or man's? All right, point to someone next to you and say... Doing what is right in whose eyes? Is it in God's eyes or is it in man's eyes? Where do we get this? Verse 1 of this chapter starts out, And the people of Israel again, everybody say again, did what was evil in the sight of the what? Of the Lord. And so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now look at Judges 17, 6. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own, what? Eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So it's a time before the kings of Israel started. And there is chaos because there's no spiritual leadership going on. And God was raising up leaders. But because there was no national leader... Because of that, they were following all the ways of this world. And as the Bible said here, they were doing what was right in their own eyes. But in the eyes of the Lord, it was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this is something that I want to share with you. Tim Keller in his book, Judges for You, actually talks about this. He says, everybody was doing what was right in his own eyes. And this obscures the fact that what the people didn't understand was they thought what they were doing was perfectly fine and acceptable to God. They thought, hey, we're not doing anything wrong. They didn't think, they weren't thinking, hey, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. No, quite the opposite. They didn't think what they were doing was wrong. They thought what they were doing was right according to their own eyes. But in the eyes of the Lord, it was totally the opposite. So as Tim Keller shares, he says, it's not just violating your own conscience. It's more than just violating what society says. It's, vi- it's more than just violating what the community agrees upon as right and wrong. Sin is actually a violation of your relationship with God. And sin is violating God's standards, not man's standards. And I have to make this a real point because, you know, as a pastor living in the United States of America who loves our country and wants to see revival come, can I get an amen to that? And yet we see what's going on with the whole fervor of transgender bathrooms and all of these things. And let me be very clear. God has called us to love all sinners. Can I get an amen to that? God loves all sinners. But we also need to understand what sin is. And we got to say what God calls sin is sin. And today, the, the pressure on the pulpit is, can you just muffle it? Just appeal to the crowd? Just to be popular? Just so that people like you? Just so that you don't have to be controversial? And isn't that what's going on today? Because society says, 
You know, but now we're so modern, we're so intellectual, we're so learned and educated today. We don't believe what used to be called wrong is wrong anymore. Now we just make it acceptable today. And as a result in the pulpit, we're being pressured. Don't, don't say anything about that. Just say, God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And yet, I'm struggling now with would I feel comfortable allowing my daughter to go to a certain bathroom now? Just because of the fact that we're violating our own, the majority's rights in terms of what we think is decent and right? You see, it's a dangerous thing when we just say people or people in certain authority positions or whatever dictates and says something that's contrary to the word of God. Can I get an amen to that? And just because the majority says so doesn't make it right. We have to follow God's prescription through and through in the way. As Keller uses an illustration about the Holocaust, the terrible Holocaust, annihilation of so many millions of Jews. And yet, in that country of Germany back then, many of them thought that they were, what they were doing was right. Because they thought, hey, we're doing the world a favor. And in their thinking, they thought it was right. Why is it that in certain countries today, Christians are being beheaded for their faith? And in their thinking, the people that are oppressing, they think they're doing right. You see, we have to stand firm on nothing but the word of the Lord. Because that's where authority and power is. And if we don't speak from that, we lose our prophetic power and voice. We will just... Meander and follow away the ways of the Lord. When this is a time when we say we love all people and we want all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But we have to not compromise and instead follow the Lord. Can it get a loud amen to that? Amen. And I'm asking you, as a church, as believers in Jesus Christ, follow what the Bible says and not what societal says. We need to stay true to that. Because what we think is good in our own eyes may be wicked in the Lord's eyes. And that's why, you know, I'm so, I was so encouraged, if I may share this with you. Just yesterday morning, a, a dear sister and her husband texted me. And they shared that um, the, the Lord gave that person a dream. And, and I'm not in, this, in any way tooting my own horn in that way. But, you know, um, it was something that was on my heart. Because for me, you, those who know me know that integrity and honor is such a key thing. Because it really validates and gives authority to what we are saying. And then this sister texted me and said, you know, um, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was conversing with the Lord. And, and the Lord said that you're a good, good shepherd and pastor. And I just wanted to encourage that with you. And when I heard that, that really blessed my heart. Because you have my word here. We will stick to God's word and his principles. You have my word on that. Why? I fear God more than I fear you. If every one of you walks out and never comes back next week, please do come back next week, don't worry about it. <laughs> but I fear the Lord. I'm not here to be graded by man, to make sure I please man. I'm going to be graded by God. Are you standing on my principles, my truth? Are you diluting it or are you not compromising it, Stephen? And I want to challenge us as Christians today. It's time to make the rubber meet the road. We need to walk the talk and start to live out God's truth. And this is where the, 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 the darkness is getting bigger, but the light shines even further. When you stand true to God, you will shine God's light even brighter. And it's going to be that much more appealing in that way. And so it's in that culture that what was going on, just like in our culture today, people were saying this is wrong is now right and, wrong, and right is now wrong. They're doing whatever is right in their own eyes, but it was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And God said, I need to raise up a leader that will be able to deliver the people of Israel, my people, from all that's going on. And it so happens in that way. So I want to challenge you for those of you who are being tested right now in your workplace everybody's compromising and everybody's not showing integrity and they're moving up the corporate ladder and leaving you behind. Stand firm in the Lord. I want to challenge you youth, just because everybody's doing drugs or whatever doesn't make it right in Jesus' name. And just because others are not being totally honest and they're cheating and all that doesn't make it right. Just because the majority doesn't, doesn't make it right. 
You stand true because this is a test of your character. And when you stand true to this, even though in the short term, others are going further away ahead of you, God will fight your battle. And God will open the doors for you as a result of that. And that's why I ask you to keep on praying for me and the leader, senior leadership that we will never compromise God's word in that way. But today we have people who always want to do what they think is their right in their own eyes. Imagine this. What if um, you know, uh, a couple of you, you know, uh, people come up to me and uh, come up to me as a pastor and say, uh, uh, as your pastor, and say, Pastor, uh, you know, I, I talk with every person in our church. And you know, uh, you know your membership requirements about honesty? Well, um, we just feel now that, you know, our society tolerates kind of different views and all that stuff. And, you know, people are kind of watering things down a little bit. So uh, we feel that that is too, too in the past, is outdated. Can you change the membership requirement now that you don't have to be an honest person anymore to be a member of our church? Or somebody comes to uh, Pastor, uh, you know, we're in the 21st century, Pastor. I love the church. I love your preaching because you never let me fall asleep. Praise God for that, right? But, um, you know, and I know that you want to follow the Lord, but, you know, uh, can you kind of change the requirement that we strive to live a life of purity? Because everybody's doing it. The majority of culture says it's okay, so why can't we just kind of catch up to the times and say, hey, we're hip, we're with it. Can't you just do it? It's a, think about it this way, Pastor. You know, you're, you're old school. You're like the old running man. But this is the, this is the, this is the what? The, the new running man. I know I can't dance at work. I'm old timer, right? I was going into a dance off with my son the other day. I said, you know what, Colin? Your new version of the running man is the lazy man's version of the running man. <laughs> You call this running? This is running. This is more exercise. You want to get maximum input with minimal input right there. But you see how if we, we think like just because the majority votes on something, we think it's, we need to stand true to God's word. Can I get an amen to that? Point on someone else and say, do it right in the eyes of the Lord. Do it right in the eyes of the Lord. Second thing I want to share with you is that fact that your area of barrenness, everybody say barrenness, okay? is the very place where God will do something great. It says here in verse 2, there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. Man, that sounds like he's moaning or something, right? And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel Lord appeared to the woman and said, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Here again, we come upon another instance in the Bible of another barren woman. Question. Why is the Bible full of so many stories of barren women? I was intrigued by that, and so I studied. And you know what's amazing? There are seven accounts of seven women, of which Samson's mom is one of them. And seven is a complete number, remember? Seven clear accounts of barren women. And you know what the amazing thing is? Every count of a barren woman, there is a trend, a biblical trend that follows. A woman is barren for X number of years. Then the word of the Lord comes to an angel or whatever and says, you shall conceive and give birth to a child. And you know what the amazing thing is? Every one of those children became great leaders of God. Every single one. Abraham and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah gave birth to Jacob and Esau. And then Rachel gave birth to her sons. Some of them became the 12 tribes of Israel, of which Joseph was one of as well. And then the Shunammite woman, who was given a prophetic word, was able to give and bear fruit. Hannah in the Old Testament, who was without child, bearing for so many, she prayed, and God gives her the prophet Samuel. Elizabeth in the New Testament, barren and old, gives birth to John the Baptist. And here, a nameless woman. The Bible doesn't even mention Samson's mom's name. A nameless woman, barren, and yet she gives birth to the most powerful judge of all, judge leader of all, in Samson. 
And what was amazing was I was studying this, I realized, wow, God, every time there's barrenness is ordained by the Lord and something great uh, comes about as a result. Point is, I want to say something great comes after barrenness. Something great comes after barrenness. Now, if you believe that, can I get a loud amen to that, all right? Something great comes always after a season of barrenness. Why is there that season of waiting in that way? You see, God's perfect will always meets resistance from the enemy. And when we meet the resistance of the enemy, we have to continue to remember that there is spiritual warfare going on even right now. During the praise, there was spiritual warfare going on. And as we even was reminded of at the men's retreat, even right now during the service, there is a spiritual battle going on. If God opened up our eyes, we would see right over this sanctuary right here that we converted from a school meeting room into a sanctuary. In the spiritual realms, there is a spiritual battle going on. And the demons of hell are fighting the angels of heaven. And souls are at stake. Marriages are at stake. Destinies of children are at stake. That's why it's so important to come and we worship God all out. Can I get an amen to that? You think really that I ask you to say amen just to keep it exciting here? No, it's because we are in a spiritual battle. Why is it that when you're talking with everyone else, you're wide awake? But if someone starts preaching God's word, you get to sleep, be clear, buggy eyed monster coming over your eyes. Why is it that when you huh, are able to just eat food and enjoy it right there, but when you taste the God's word, all of a sudden people get sleepy? Because there's a spiritual battle. And the enemy, the Bible says in John 10 10, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. See, God wants me to. Sow a seed of God's word in your life. But the enemy right now is trying to steal, kill, and destroy and rob you of that seed. As I'm preaching, I wonder what the score is for the L.A. Dodgers right now. As I'm preaching, I wonder what's for lunch today. As I'm preaching, oh man, I have that work deadline due by tomorrow. You see, all these things happening on. But that's why... I'm not the only one ministering right now. You are right now as well. That's why when you say amen, it comes in agreement. And as the angels of heaven and the devils are fighting, when you say an amen, you're actually tipping the skills so that we're able to have a breakthrough. That's why we're going not just for good service, but for breakthrough service in Jesus' name. We're not here just for good praise. We want breakthrough where the clouds are rolled back and the angels of heaven are coming down and people who are dead in their hearts are starting to feel awake and alive by the presence of God Almighty. We're here for breakthrough preaching. Can you get a louder amen to that? You're not here. Is the pastor going to give a message here for me? I'm here to agree with God's plan for my life. I'm not here to just get by and say, I went to church, God, so bless me today. I want to be able to be set free. All the lies of the enemy come down. Devil, don't even talk to me. Talk to the hand right there because I'm hearing the word of the Lord. Don't even talk to that. Talk to the pinky right there because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Can I get a lie? I'll amen to that. In fact, don't even talk to the pinky. You're not worth it because I was worth Jesus dying on the cross for. Talk to the earwax on my pinky nail right there all the more. Can I get a loud amen? amen? See, it's definitely serious that we're doing this together because we're serious about God. And when we're serious about God, I want you to know that you, whatever you're bearing, God, for a certain period of time, is sending his spirit, his Holy Spirit. And the angels are fighting and trying to make sure that if you're aligning in obedience and agreement, it's going to happen. But the enemy is there trying to deter you. Not you. Not you. Look what, what you've done. And when you realize that, as I shared with you, every story of barrenness had a breakthrough where God gave something great. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I feel a prophetic word. Some of you that have been contending in barrenness, wait actively and keep worshiping the Lord. Because the breakthrough and the blessing will surely come to pass. If you receive that, can I get an amen to that? Seven women, all barren, gave birth to children of greatness. 
But I also realized there was one woman in the Bible who remained barren for the rest of her life. Who was that? That was none other than King David's wife, Michael. You know the story, don't you? David's bringing the Ark of the Covenant, and the king of Israel was so emphatic about worship. He loved to worship. And so he took down to his tidy whities linen and fod, and he was dancing and rejoicing and offering sacrifice each at a certain period as the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into the city of God. And Michael, his wife, saw him, and she despised him in his heart. And when he came, David worshiped God. He came to bless his household, bless his children. It says here in 2 Samuel 6, when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. The Bible says, verse 23, and Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children today. Why do I say this? Because there's a correlation there. I really believe because Michael despised her husband's worship. Therefore, she despised worshiping God all out. You see, unless there's some sacrifice of humility, it's not true worship. If you just come and you sing, and there's no sacrifice, worship has to be sacrificial. Can I get an amen to that? It has to require your humility. And when you humble yourself before God and say, God, I don't feel like my every cell of my body says against it, but I'm going to worship you in that way still nonetheless. When you do so and you bring that under the captivity of Christ, that's when God accepts that as worship. Michael was not willing to worship like David did. And two, because of that, it's because she despised her husband's worship as a result. I believe that's the reason why she was barren for the rest of her life as a result of that. And that's God's way of saying worship is such a key thing during your period of barrenness. What usually is the first thing to go when you're not doing well spiritually? It's your worship. You start wanting to worship God all out. But that's why the Bible says that we need to magnify, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 1, let everything that has breath, if you have breath in this room, somebody shout amen. Amen. If you have breath, somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. If you have breath, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord. And then it emphasizes praise the Lord. And then it says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. You see, God created every cell of your body. Therefore, every cell of your body was intended for worship. Not just your vocal cords, not just your mind, not just your eyes, not just your hands, but every cell of your body was intended for worship. Are you track with me? That's why when we do it this way and we worship God in that way and we let and say, every cell of my, all that is within me, I will bless his holy name. What you're doing is you're doing what you were intended for to worship God and you're bathing your life in the very presence of God Almighty. Therefore, that's why I may have come to church and I am a little bit weak from my food, a stomach bug, but I'm still going to lift up my hands and worship him anyway. Therefore, some of you, if you're struggling with cancer, even these cancer cells shall be filled with the sounds of praise. Let all that is within me bless his holy name. Even a barren womb, let these cells be filled with the sound of praise. Can I get a hallelujah for that? You see, when you fill your life with praise, that's when the presence and the favor and the power of God is released even further. And when you do so, that's when you experience breakthrough praise. I don't know who I'm preaching to, 
But that's why when we're singing, I'm like jumping up and down, even though I may feel a little dizzy today because I don't know whether my equilibrium was messed up by my stomach bug for a couple days or not. I'm still going to worship God all out. That's why I commend a brother like Brian Coe, who can't even move his head right now because of that car accident. He's still here to worship God all out. You may have him come, and you may not be feeling well. All your circumstances may not be going well. You're waiting on the Lord. But that's what it means when Job said, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But my God is still God, and I will trust him, and I will still bless his most holy name. Can I get an amen to that? You need to understand the discipline and the victory of praise and worship. It doesn't come just because things are going well. You make your worship change your situation. You may have cancer, but that's not going to rob me of letting every cell of my body be covered with the anointing of praise. And I really believe when I was praying in my prayer closet this morning, the more praise we have at this church, that's such opening up the heavens, I believe as every cell in our body, all that is with me, bless his holy name, I believe the Lord's going to pour out blessings of healing. Where God's presence is so thick and so strong that we will see barrenness overcome by worship. And then we get overcome by the word of the Lord. And I want to encourage all of you, if you've been barren and you've been waiting on the Lord, keep on worshiping God and trusting in Him. Because the longer you wait, the greater the breakthrough that God has in store for you as a result of that. So wait for the Lord. He shall not fail you. If you agree with me, can I get an amen to that? Point at someone next to you and say, hey, your barrenness will turn to blessedness. Your barrenness will turn to blessedness. Say it right there to them right now. The third thing I want to share with you as uh, Samson's mom. And it's such an amazing thing. You know, there's some of me, I, I want to just encourage some of you. Some of you feel like your life is so insignificant. You don't have more than a thousand Facebook friends. Instagram, you only have 40 followers. I don't know, Twitter, maybe 20. And you feel like you're so insignificant, you're nameless. Samson's mom, I don't know why God does not name her. The boy who gave the two fish and the five loaves, nameless. There's some people that are nameless, and yet God uses them greatly. Can I get an amen to that? And I want to encourage you not to give up on the Lord, but to trust Him in that way, because that leads me to my third point, which is that we need to leave a mark showing God's love and character over rules and physical power. Samson's mom gets word and tells her husband, Manoah, and Manoah meets the angel later on. and says, what must we do to raise this child up properly? And then the angel repeats it. He's supposed to be a Nazarite. Raise him up so that he doesn't drink any wine or strong drink from the vine. Make sure that he doesn't touch any unclean thing. And make sure he doesn't get any hair, haircut. Raise your son up like a hippie. Make sure his hair gets long all the days of his life. Why? It was to show that he was set apart, fully dedicated to God. And you know what? To be honest with you, it was a strict life. Most Nazarites took vows for only 30 to 60 days. His, his whole life. What? Mom, you're telling me I, I can't even drink any wine when I, for my own wedding day? What? I can't even drink grape juice because it's from the vine? What? I can't get my hair cut? I know it's going to save you oodles of money, but still. What? I'm not supposed to touch any uh, dead thing? Even like a dead bug? That's going to make me ceremonial unclean. You know why you're fully dedicated to God. And it says here in verse 4, Therefore be careful, drink no wine or strong juice, eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the, Israel, uh, from the, of the Philistines. A Nazarite was someone that was dedicated to God to show, distinguish, that they were fully dedicated to the Lord in that way. And God, as a result of that, his parents took that to heart. But as we started to see starting from next week, they taught him all the rules, all the regulations, but they failed to teach Samson the heart of God and the true personal character of God. They taught him as God out there, and he requires this, 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 and this, and this, and this. 
but they didn't teach him how to love God. Because let's be honest, I could give so many rules to my kids. When they go to college, I could say, Colin Stephen Chung, I have written up 200 rules for you when you're in college. These are two not to do is right there. But is it going to cover everything? No. So what's more important to show him and teach him the character of God and God's heart and God's love so that when some situation happens that I never taught him about, he would still know the heart of God and character of God and strive to do it in that way. And so that's why it's so important. I know many of you parents, you want to raise up world changers. But if you expect the church to be the one that only raises them in the ways of the Lord, you are in for a grave awakening. You got to model it. Can I get an amen to that? I know your parents don't want to say that. Don't just drop your kids off at youth. Pastor Josh, you're the one that holds the destiny of my child and live for the rest of his life. Thank you. God bless you right there. So you're expecting a pastor who sees your kid once or twice a week to change your child's life when they see you all the time. See you all the time when you say, praise the Lord, thank you, pastor, for giving me a call. Thank you, I'll see you at Rev Up this Friday. Get your homework done right now. I know I'm making you feel uncomfortable because I don't see you here too many amens right now on that point right there. <laughs> yes, we need to be corrective, but we need to show them the heart and the generous love of God in that way. You know, yesterday, um, my wife Facebook posted it. You know, um, we went to our school nearby, uh, neighbor, uh, and then, um, you know, as many of you know, my daughter has, uh, especially she's legally blind, and, um, and uh, so she wanted to ride her bike. And uh, so we took her to a playground where there's no obstruction so she could, like, bike easily. And, um, you know, raising a teenage child is not easy. I'll, I'll just be honest with you in that way. Right? And, uh, and so we're... My wife is trying to do it, and I helped out a little bit later on as well, but our daughter is very stubbornly independent. I do it myself. Mommy, Dad, I do it myself. Mommy, Dad, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> so we're like, oh, okay, well, let's just, let's just kind of help you along. And, and, uh, and we did that, and, and she was starting to bike around a little bit and all that. And then afterwards, you know, we went, hey, Colin and I were shooting basketball, and, and then uh, my, mom, my wife said, hey, Colin, you know, let me, sh- let, me, let me show you how it's done. And she comes in this volleyball stance. She takes the ball like this, and she shoots it like she's setting a volleyball, and she shoots it into the basket right there. But you know what blessed my heart? I fell in head over heels in love with my wife right there again. You know why? Even though this was an awkward pose like this, <laughs> let me show you, Collins, this is how it's done. And she didn't make the basket. <laughs> but she scored with me, all right? <laughs> I saw her fun-loving side, you know, and um, just to get down, and, and my, my son did play uh, uh, his mom, and he won 10 nothing, but it's okay, right? This is, you know, just a side note right there. But what I made me fall in love with my wife all over again when I saw that was um, just sharing such a loving heart to just not just cook food, but just spend time and have fun with the kids. And then when you say, hey, Karis, you know, she wanted, so we let her try, and she started making baskets. She has vision impairment, and she just took, I think the angel of God just took the ball and just kind of like <laughs> got it to the basket and went in. And, uh, and we said, hey, great job. And then I threw the ball kind of at the sideline. And she just, I thought she was going to miss. She got it, and she went. And she went, she has a, maybe she learned it from mom, kind of a funny move. She went, and the ball spins like this, but it went in. And I realized, wow, Karen, you're really good. And then, of course, my wife says, they get their athleticism from me. <laughs> Being a good husband, I say, yeah, yeah, whatever you believe. Right? <laughs> but, you know, as we're walking back, and yes, my daughter did fall on the bike. She scraped her knee. And I haven't stopped hearing about it. Daddy hurt my knee. I hurt my knee. But it was, you know, but when we were walking back, I realized what does it mean for me to tell my kids about faith in the Lord? 
Yes, I give a lot of rules as a pastor, right? PK, they have under a lot of pressure. If the pastor's kid, you better behave, whatever, and all that. But what I realized I connect the most with was I'm just a dad. Hey, Colin, let's play basketball. Okay. And I haven't played for over a year. I stunk. But then I got started getting my win back and I started playing. And just seeing that moment happen unfold really blessed my heart as a result. And I realized this is what it means to share with them that God is love. And instead of just rules, Samson, you got to do this, you got to do this. They failed to teach them about God's generous heart and love. And because of that, he had rules in his head and rules in his heart, but he didn't have the relationship with God. Not to the degree that he did. He could have been an incredible leader, the most powerful, strong man in the world. And if you, as we'll see in the upcoming chapters and verses, most of them were as a result of his fleshly failings. What a tragedy. And yet at the end, God still used that to redeem him and bring him out and be able to lead his people for one final act of giving us life. But I share all this because we need to share about the generous heart of God. Can I get an amen to that? Can we show the, um, we have the picture of that family? If it just show up. Some of you may know this. These, they, they're from the East Coast. Actually, uh, the lady, I grew up with her uh, when uh, college age from my whole old former church when I became a pastor. She was... And um, that's her husband, uh, Bernie, and Maggie is the, is the wife's name. Both of them are medical doctors. And they came to our church a couple times because we went and spoke at my home, home, home church way, way back growing up in the East Coast of Maryland. And we went to a conference and spoke there in January. And they got so blessed and they came. And then they, we met with them for breakfast and they said, you know, if it's okay with you, we consider Revival Church our home church when we come to visit my, my, uh, the Bernie's uh, pa- the husband, the parents, they live here in Irvine. So I said, yeah, you're, you're more than welcome to do so. Well, we'd love to have you. And that's their uh, daughter, uh, Sierra, um, beautiful young lady there. And um, about maybe about a month and a half ago, I got an email from them. I said, can you pray for us? Because uh, they had a hard time having their first child. And I guess they wanted to have another child. And uh, they're praying. They said, you know, Pastor, can you pray for us? We're actually going to be in the area because uh, we've been praying about adopting a child. And there's a, a Chinese family that I think if my memory serves correct, they're going to go back to China, but they want to give their newborn baby away for adoption. And we've been praying about this. And, um, and both of them are medical doctors, as I said. And upon disclosure, they found out that the baby would have has some type of genetic disorder where there's something wrong with the heart. And because of that, they it hit them like, wow, it's not a perfectly healthy baby. And then God kind of made them go up and down. They were going to get the child, and then at the last minute, the adoption agents gave it to another family. And they thought, I guess it's not gospel. And then all of a sudden, something happened where they were able to have the child again. And um, they were sharing with us, and my wife and I met them over a breakfast just a few days after they were able to get the child. And that little girl... Isn't she cute? Her name is Vivian Ruth. And I assume the last name they adopted her is Kim. And a beautiful little Chinese baby, beautiful girl. And uh, Vivian uh, means life. And her middle name, Ruth, means redeemed. And Bernie wanted me to share this because I asked permission for it. He said, can you just let them know that her name means Vivian Ruth? life redeemed because that's how God redeems all of our lives and as a result of that I see this picture and it was such a beautiful thing because you know um, some of you know me I always had a heart eventually I thought maybe I could adopt and I'm like 48 years old now so I, I don't know how how much energy I have for this but when I heard that they still wanted to adopt this child even though they knew that she was gonna have all these medical issues I was blown away by how generous and loving a heart that they have. 
All of us want perfectly healthy kids, right? But they knew that this child was not, would have a heart issue, and yet they still wanted to adopt this child. And that, to me, blessed me because I really believe that reflects the very heart of God himself. That God is such a loving God that he sees all of us with our imperfections, with all our hang-ups, and yet he still says, I still want you. I still want you. And I want you to leave a mark. You know, like I said, I saw my wife show me that Facebook thing where that lady with the Chewbacca face, you know, and it's like, what, over 100 million views? Wow. This family story doesn't have 100 million views. They're nameless. You only, you only know them because I mentioned them. They're just two Christian doctors who wanted to bless and take home a child, in this case, a child with some type of heart issues. And yet, they were able to do something that no one else was willing to do, and they are now leaving a mark of raising this child in a godly home. And I want to challenge all of you. You all have a unique set of fingerprints that only you can leave behind. And if you would focus on the fact that Eddie, if you are called to be a Christian attorney, even though most attorneys are sharks anyway, you be the most godly Christian attorney in L.A., downtown L.A., and leave your unique fingerprint upon that place. If some of you are business people, and you see all these things that are going on that's not right, you be the most godly Christian business person there. And you leave your fingerprint right there that you are doing it for the Lord. Some of you who are moms and you feel, I'm not even working, Pastor. I'm just trying to get by here and there. Just like the nameless Samson's mom. You have a chance uniquely to leave a fingerprint upon your children's life. And you can perhaps raise a world changer. Can I get an amen to that? So even you youth today, you feel like, Everybody else is more popular, whatever. God has given you, look at your hands, unique set of fingerprints. Only you will ever leave that mark on this world. And that's why we started this church, if some of you are looking for a church. Because I will not waste my life trying to keep up with the Joneses. I'm going to let every heartbeat count for Jesus Christ. I'm going to let every word I say talk about the good news of Jesus. Many of you know my mom is just a stay-at-home, retired lady who fragile in health, fused lower back and all that. And to the world's eyes, she's ne she, wasn't, she didn't make it. It wasn't successful. But she raised me in the fear of the Lord. She thought I was, she wanted me to become a medical doctor, but God had different plans. I'm more of a spiritual doctor as a preacher of God's word. And as I close, I want to challenge all of you, whatever God's called you to do, leave your fingerprint and do it best for the glory of God. For me, if I'm supposed to be a yellow pencil preacher, so be it. Yellow on the outside, but black on the inside, that's fine with me. I will be the best preacher I can every Sunday, not compromise God's word, and challenge all of you to awaken from your slumber and live all out for Jesus Christ. To praise all out every Sunday for the Lord. To serve and use your gifts, because it's not just having the gifts, but following God's heart that will determine your destiny right there. So if you are here, I want to challenge by saying, can we show that Martin Luther, Martin Luther quote right there? The Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on shoes, but by making good shoes. That deserves a loud amen to that. I Facebook shared that. I forgot who originally shared that. Whatever you call to do, do it all for the glory of Jesus Christ. And leave your mark for the Lord. If you receive that today, can I get an amen? Let's all stand before the Lord. Let's all stand.